Hey everybody, welcome to, we're calling this Guitar Builders Roundtable. So I have two new friends that I'm super excited to introduce you guys to. And if you're like me, you love guitars, particularly acoustic guitars, and you're starting to kind of figure out that they're factory guitars, they're boutique guitars, and now there's this whole new world that we're all kind of discovering and learning about, which is hand-built guitars. And the two guys that I get to interview, they are amazingly uh, talented, they make incredible guitars, and I'm excited to introduce you to both of them. So, Gage, Leo, congratulations, or congratulations, that's the wrong word. Thanks for coming on. Thank you. Thanks for having me. Yeah, cool. So, real quick, uh, who are you and what are you about? Uh, how about Leo? You go first. Well, I am a guitar maker based in Berkeley, California. Um, I've been working in guitars for over a decade. I am originally from Argentina, and I came to this country 11 years ago. Uh, I did a, over three years apprenticeship with uh, Urban Samoji, which is a well-known uh, luthier that he started back in the 70s. Uh, and after that, in 2015, I started my own business, and, and, and here I am. That's amazing. Cool. And I'll put some pictures of your guitars up uh, in the video here. Gage, okay. how about you? Who are you and what are you about? Uh, my name is Gage Halland. I've been, like Leo, I've been building guitars for about 10 years. I'm out of Livingston, Montana. Um, I apprenticed with Michael Greenfield out of Montreal, Quebec. And I think seven years ago, set out on my own and have been building ever since. Man, that is so cool. Cool. Yeah. And that's what, that's where I first heard about you was through, uh, some Greenfield guitars. Cause I love Andy McKee and I've followed him for years and, mm -hmm. uh, yeah. And then there's some cool and I'll, we'll talk about it later, but there's, I can definitely see some flavor, some DNA, uh, in your guitars that come from that, which is really, really cool. Uh, so cool. Let's get the tacky question first out of right out of the bat. What's ballpark price for your guitars? Because most of my crowd that's coming, it's people that love Martins, love Gibsons, and they're starting to figure out about boutique acoustic guitars, the Hassan Daltons of the world, the Pagets of the world, the five, seven, ten thousand. But where are you guys as far as ballpark when someone wants to say, I want a guitar from you guys? Uh, Leo? <laughs> um, I'm sorry, did I go it's... straight for the tacky question? No, no, it, That's it, it's one. It comes up. I mean, you got to answer it. I can't. You can't say oh, I'm not telling you. It's uh, my average sales price is around twenty thousand dollars. And that's what. Yeah, that's what I assumed. Yeah, yeah. And mine yeah. is amazing. Yeah, but that's. I mean, it's you're kind of coming into it that if you're asking if that's your first question, it might not be. <laughs> anyway, we'll talk about that more later on. But how do you choose materials for the guitars that you build? Is it are you buying in batches? Are you looking here and there? What's your process for sourcing tone woods? Well, the process starts with the client. No? The, I mean, the client has a, I mean, people who usually order these kind of guitars, they are, uh, they already know a, a lot about guitars. It's funny sometimes, well, not anymore, but in the beginning, I, I, I remember that sometimes uh, I learned out of the questions of my clients because they, they had a lot of information and, mm. and I had to go and research because sometimes I say, oh, what is this? What is that? You know, well, especially uh, in this new world of, of boutique guitars. But yeah, the, the tone woods are basically chosen by, I mean, you oriented the client and you, you talk to them. I mean, you, you ask them what they want, what, what they're expecting. I mean, tone wise, timber, I mean, sound in general. And, and after that, uh, you suggest some, some tongue woods that can accomplish those kind of qualities that the client is looking for. Absolutely. Yeah. Cool. And so if you, uh, here's another question. Um, what do you wish buyers would know about your guitars or as you've, so a mentor of mine used to always say to me that that clarity lives just on the other side of complexity. And so for us, I mean, you two are masters of, and you know what it takes to make an excellent guitar. And it comes through understanding all of the complexity. What's a, what's a, 
what's a detail that you wish that more people would know about guitars? Figure doesn't equal tone. <laughs> that's one. Oh, that's... Um, having a crazy figured instrument does not necessarily mean it's going to be a better sounding instrument. I think that that's, uh, and, and aesthetics are important. I'm not, I'll be the first to say that if it's not beautiful, people don't want to play it. That's just kind of how I feel. And, mm. but I do, I get a lot of inquiries that where people assume a Brazilian rosewood with this wild figure is going to be better than a straight grain Brazilian rosewood back. And people who have been around long enough know that that's just not the case, but I, I do get a lot of inquiries like that. that like tone, tone the woods back aesthetically and they seem to sound better acoustically. Hmm. Yeah. And I wonder, you know, what, what would make that? I know I owned a, I've owned a handful of forties, fifties, sixties, Martins with Brazilian. And I always love the look of the super inky stripey stuff, but some of my favorites have definitely been the very straight grain that almost look like Indian. Like it, they're, mm. they're a little boring to look at, but they definitely, yeah, that's really wise. Well, and also, and also, I think uh, we have the the ability of of um, I mean, each guitar is different, and of course, we follow a consistency, and, and and we keep records of whatever we do, and and we change here and there some things to achieve different things. Uh, but of course, each client is coming to us with a different perspective and a different taste in a different playing style, different. Uh, so they, they want different things. They want different custom features before they want different action. They want different tone. I mean, it's not the same a person who plays just the other person who plays bluegrass. So you, you need to educate the client to so they can go uh, in a good track, trying to follow those uh, Parameters, no. I mean that that's that's one of the huge advantage of boutique guitars of, of working directly with the client. Not only having the responsibility and, and being there. I mean this amazing relationship that we create with clients. Uh, not only being there for them all the time, even when you finish the guitar. Also, uh, it's I mean our job and our responsibility is basically to orient them uh, to to achieve what are they dreaming of you no know? and, and what kind of guitar they're looking for i mean again not all tone woods respond in the same way not even talking about top back, i mean back and sides but tops are very different from each other and i, f I feel like also that's one of the big difference with factory guitars and handmade guitars you no know? Absolutely. I, I don't want to extend myself a lot because, but uh, this is, this is a I mean, like the hours topic. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> uh, I've learned so much. Uh, so I have a Paget guitar made by Ben Paget in Monterey, Virginia. He taught at the Gallup school for, I think eight or nine years. Um, he's, be and what's amazing is he's become a dear friend. Like he's now one of my favorite people that I text all the time. And we just yuck it up and talk about life. And I'll take my guitar back to him and he always does more work than, you know, where I'm like, I just, you know, I need a little bit of a setup and, you know, do this and put a pickup in it. And then when I come back, he's like, well, I didn't like how the bridge was seating. Mm -hmm. So I took the bridge off. I re, you know, I sanded it. I put it back down and, you know, he does all this stuff, but it's this amazingly personal relationship that you build when you get a guitar that yeah. you picked for, for, for me, it's picking the bare woods and then having that like, all of those memories of translating we talked about it i saw some wood you did it you asked me about neck profiles and then i got this guitar and then i played it for after my kid was born you know like mm -hmm. it just becomes a part of your life which i think is incredible yeah yeah and it's a lifetime commitment for us no i mean each guitar is like a um it's it's a it's a lifetime commitment of of care i mean we we really care about each guitar we build i mean Again, we build like a, a handful of guitars every year. Yeah. And, 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 and it's a, yeah, I mean, basically it's a, it's something that we care about. Absolutely. Um, that fits straight into a question that I have over here, 
which is as you think about each project, do you have a personal goal for each build or how do you view each project independently, but also as part of your traveling collection, your scattered collection of, of work? Mm. Um, I wouldn't say, I guess the way that I read the question is that, is there a specific bill or uh, goal in the build that may deviate every time? So we're going to have a different goal in a different build. Um, if that's the case, I, I just try to refine it over and over and over again. My idea is to sharpen it, to sharpen the design, to sharpen the instrument so that it's better every time. Um, and I don't, I can't say that I have one goal. Um, I, I mean, we all want to build the best guitars in the world. I think that's the goal that every guitar maker has if they're doing it for a living is your name's attached to it. It should be as good as you can build it. And then you want to be constantly progressing. Mm -hmm. um, so I guess that's the only goal I have is to get better every time. Absolutely. I know for me, so over the last couple of years, especially during COVID, which it was before COVID even, but I've been really interested in uh, making bread. And what I find is it's this long, complicated process with one end result, but there's a million variables along the way. And what mm -hmm. I found, and I feel like is similar and analogous to guitar building is the part that I was the most interested in is shaping the loaf, but that's a two minute part of a 14 hour process. And that's what I'm sure with you guys building guitars, what are the small details that you only, that take a little bit of time, but each time you build a guitar, that's the, do you have something analogous or, or parallel to that? The milestones that you hit along the way, sort of. I think, I don't know about Leo, but for me, when you bend the wood and it becomes a guitar shape, that's an important, I mean, you start to get a feel for what the instrument's going to actually be like in your hands. That's always kind of special to me, but. That is cool. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I don't, I don't, I don't know if I have a, one of those. <laughs> <laughs> That's fair. Cool. Um, so uh, what's a corner that you refuse to cut in the process? Because you guys build. I mean, like you said, Gage, like you're building, you are aspiring to build the best guitars in the world. What are, what are some corners that you would refuse to cut? You can't cut any corners. <laughs> um, I love there, <laughs> there's, there's, that's good. That's what I'm say exactly the same. <laughs> <laughs> well, there's a, there's a saying I heard recently that, that stuck with me that you can only lower your standard once and then that's your new standard. So you oh. can't, you can't cut any corners. You have to, uh, there's no such thing as good enough, which I, I actually hate that expression. Um, what is it that perfection is the enemy of good enough? I'm like, good, good enough ain't good enough. <laughs> like, mm. That's just kind of how I feel. That's what I, so one of, so you can see this big guitar hanger behind me. Um, mm -hmm. So it's my friend Zeke. He is this incredible sculptor and artist here on the Shenandoah Valley. And for him, he hates that phrase too. And he makes some of the most beautiful things I've ever seen. And he's like, it is either your work or it's not done. He's like, yeah, yeah. you know. Yeah, it's so. building corners more, more than cutting corners. <laughs> oh, that's good. <laughs> Making them more sharper and sharper every time. <laughs> yep. Oh, yep. yeah. That's so good. And uh, I love, because you guys have both, it seems like you've limited to where you build, you know, 10 guitars, 12 guitars a year. And that's that's as much as you can handle because... There is no compromising. There's no, no. yeah, your standard mm -hmm. is here. Mm -hmm. Yeah. That's really well, and cool. I, I've reached the point where I would rather, I'm going to reduce production because I would rather focus more on making the guitars better than always feel like I have to get 12 out a year. Is that, if that makes sense. Yeah. And, um, and, you know, if, if you're good, you can command the price to make up for it, which is what I keep thinking is if I make them good enough, then, doesn't matter if I make eight or 12. Absolutely. So um, within the acoustic guitar world, I mean, guitar world in general, there's so much tension between uh, tradition and innovation. And so what, I, what I'm wondering is, are they at odds with each other? And when does one win out over the other? When it's invisible, I think. I don't know. Leo's guitars are some of the most beautifully sculptural things. Are some of the out there. I mean, his 
his chip carve rosettes and things like that are just otherworldly. And I kind of tend to follow the other camp where I'm, I would say Leo's an artist and I'm uh, more on the industrial design side of it where um, I don't think anyone would look at my rosettes next to his and go, Oh, that's prettier. You know, I can't imagine there's a person out there that would think that. Um, and I think that if we're talking about innovation, I, I'm constantly trying to find, find another way to innovate my guitars or to at least bring them using modern materials that we haven't necessarily um, used in guitar making. But I've found that I have to hide it all. Hmm. And I have to make sure that it just looks like a guitar. And you can't have, you know, the guys that do wild stuff I'm so jealous of. <laughs> I kind of have to hide it all away. So it it fu- does the function that I want, but I, I don't want it to be the aesthetic thing. I don't want it to be the the pinpoint that people walk up and see, if that makes sense. Yeah. So what, what materials are you using and where are you hiding them? Uh, mostly the neck. Um, okay. Neck, the rim set um head blocks but it's basalt fiber carbon fiber um we're working on some 3d printed stuff but all of it is essentially hidden within the guitar to where even if you looked in the sound hole you're not going to see any of it um and you know i i don't know that it's i i think that there's people that that crave that traditional pre-war Martin stuff. And, yeah. and I love those. I do. Um, but my brain doesn't go there. It doesn't go mm-hmm. that way. Usually I want to, you know, my background's all mechanical stuff. So I tend to go mechanical. Yeah. Well, in my case is the uh, innovation is priority in sound and aesthetically. Yes. For me, obviously it's important to have a, a, a I mean, some guitars that looks artistically uh, done, but uh, but innovation, it's always, I am always achieving for improving the sound, improving like a small things. I feel like uh, every guitar that I make, I for some reason I can hear different things. And, and for some reason I feel like uh, I am controlling a little bit better over and over uh, sound and although i mean we, we cannot escape of the fact that we're working with organic materials and and, and each piece of wood is, is totally different and, and it behaves different but uh, at the same time um at the same time i think that innovation in my case uh, it's uh, it's regarding sound that's really good. It struck me. So I'm, you know, I've been chasing guitars for 20 years. That's most of what my YouTube channel is about is finding old Martins that have been hidden out since the fifties or sixties and uh, just chasing down cool guitars all over the place. And I'm, I've paid attention to boutique guitars cause I grew up, you know, I'm, I'm in Virginia, which there's a shocking amount of great builders here in, in Virginia. I knew Wayne Henderson when I used to work at a vintage guitar shop. And what's interesting is learning about the boutique world and then becoming friends with Ben Paget. I'm he's opening up my mind to like this whole new universe of guitar builders um, and following like because he knows all these guys from the Gallup school since he taught there and I've met other guys from different schools around the country. What is profound to me is that almost none of those new guitar builders uh, are building dreadnoughts. Why is that? Is there space for innovation? Is there space for new tone coming out of a dreadnought? Would either of you build, uh, and I'm sure you have, but would you lean heavily into a dreadnought in the future? No, <laughs> uh, to put a you know yeah. period at it. Um, I, I honestly, I, I want to make my guitars. I don't want to refine the dreadnought. I don't want to work on, and, and, and that's, I, it's not to say there's anything wrong with dreadnoughts. I love dreadnoughts. I love playing them, but yeah. um, my my clients are finger style guitar players, and for the most part, they're not playing dreads. And the guys that I do talk to that have dreadnoughts, they tend to be you know 
bluegrass pickers and stuff like that. And that's just not the sound I do. So I feel like yeah. they would be disappointed and it just doesn't seem worth the uh, disappointment on both ends, really. Mm. Yeah. It, yeah. No, it's no, interesting. No. Well, go ahead. No, no, I'm sorry. I'm sorry yeah. So, I mean, it's interesting because I've, I, it was just a question. Like I'm, I'm with you. Like I'm, I'm fine letting go of the dreadnought. Like I'm, uh, sorry, that's not necessarily what you said, but as I've worked through this in my head, the last couple of years, I've just found the guitars that I'm drawn to that my ears, like my hands, like my body likes are all smaller shapes. Uh, they're more ergonomic. Um, I also love, I'm starting to see a friend of mine, Steve Showalter here in the Valley is building a lot of offset acoustics that they just fit your body more than a big dreadnought. And I find myself now when I do play one, they just, yeah, they, they sit on me different and, uh, but yeah. So here's a, here's a good question coming from the perspective of an artist versus the perspective of, uh, a more mechanically inclined as, as you describe yourself, Gage materials or specs. Are materials or construction more responsible for the overall quality of tone in an instrument? Leo? <laughs> <laughs> I always like to speak first. Uh, so basically your question is if materials are responsible. So Oh. Is it so because you so Gage earlier, you said uh, figure doesn't make tone. And then if we're comparing that into what's the other? Uh, sorry. I'm going to my camera just turned off, so I'm going to I'll take that again. So Gage, you said earlier that figure doesn't equal tone. And I'm thinking in the same way. Uh, oh, the wheels have fallen off of my <laughs> hang on. Sorry, uh, that really distracted me. Um, does the quality of the material matter over the spec basically of the guitar? Is that what you're kind of getting at? Yeah. So earlier you were talking about, it's the, it's the quality of the figure of the material doesn't make it necessarily sound better, but then you're also, we've been talking about revising the process, making the best guitar each time. They're a little better. There are details that are getting sharpened. All the corners are getting built and sharpened each time. So which adds to you know, this is an impossible question, I realize. But is it the quality of the of the repetition and the artisanship that you've made in building them? Or is it finding some secret material that's actually wonderful? And oh, there's there's no secret material. That's <laughs> uh, anyone heard, that's selling you that secret there materials. <laughs> yeah, um, I will say this, that like, um, Leo and I are probably afflicted with the same wood hoarding um mm -hmm. disease where you you get you sell some instruments and you start buying up quality tone woods and the nice part about building eight to 12 guitars a year is that you can be very very picky about the materials and um i used to go to a, a supplier a top supplier and i would spend two days going through every top they have and you might leave with four mm -hmm. and there's four that make the cut they'll slap all of those tops on a pallet and ship them to Taylor Martin Gibson, let's say, and they don't have the, the, they don't have the privilege of saying, no, we're not using this one because of X, Y, or Z. They have to churn out a thousand guitars a day or whatever Taylor does. Right. Yeah. So Leo and I at least get to be very, very particular about what goes on to those instruments and spec the instrument to the material or vice versa. Um, yeah. That's not something that many, people get to do absolutely yeah. yeah yeah totally yeah and that's what that's what i think about i mean just the pure implication of a factory built guitar is different than a boutique guitar is different than a hand built guitar yeah. um like huss and dalton who's close to me they're building 300 or so guitars a year mm -hmm. they've got 12 to 15 employees and uh, i mean they're still they're they get to be more picky but they don't get to be as picky or selective as you two which is and that's where you start seeing like all these variables are still at play, but the one that's in the front for you guys is just what is the best a guitar can be. And that's what I'm, I'm hooked to figure out and to, to try and figure out a way to, to come along for that ride. So it's shockingly subjective though, too, which is interesting. Absolutely. That's what I've found. Like I'm, I'm really curious about alternative tone woods. 
uh, maybe not alternative, but just unusual. Like my favorite Martin I've ever owned is a cherry Martin, one of their sustainable woods. I have a Waterloo WLS that I play every day. It's so inspiring to me. It's cherry back and sides. My friend Steve is building guitars out of sycamore and black walnut and butternut and hemlock. And he's just using, because he's a cabinet builder, and he's just kind of building with the materials that he has. Um, but all that's really cool. So what can you tell me about the tree? Well, this is a question from Josh. It's, it's figured mahogany. Um, it's, it's gorgeous. It's an absolutely stunning material. It's mahogany, though, at the end of the day. <laughs> so yeah. it's, um, if someone specifically asked for it, then, yeah, I, I think there are some vastly superior tone woods out there, sonically speaking. Yeah. yeah. That's just but again, we, we, um, we need to have in mind that depending on what the client wants to. Absolutely. Uh, what I've, I mean, I build a lot of tree mahogany guitars, probably over a dozen already. And what I found is like uh, there's some, th probably the same like whatever tone would, no? Like uh, in a batch of 20, 30 sets, you find very good top tone or, mm -hmm. or very good uh, structured wood or, or with a good uh, stiffness uh, to a ratio uh, or flexibility or whatever. But what I'm saying is like uh, you can find good, uh, examples and pieces, and you can find so so examples and pieces. Not because it's the tree mahogany, all the tree mahogany, it's amazing. No, some of them are better, some of them are a little bit okay. Uh, as as uh, Gage said about we picking up wood and we have the ability to go and, and be in two days uh, top toning and, and flexing wood and, and, and choosing wood, I feel like uh, that's the case, you no? Know? The tree mahogany is the same like other woods. Uh, I mean, it's it's a, it's a good wood. I mean, as as as, as Jay uh, Gage said, it's yeah, it's mahogany. It's mahogany. It's a figure of mahogany. Mm -hmm. Some pieces are better. Some pieces are okay. I think that the lore behind the tree uh, tends to create unrealistic expectations when someone is when they're getting a tree set they well, think they're going to tap it and like you know angels come out and all this and <laughs> yeah and well, I, in, in you know I heard, I heard a couple of people comparing it with brazilian rosewood yeah which and is wow it that's a like, stretch to me <laughs> it was like a, um it's uh, but again it's like leo said if if it's if your client has the right expectations going into it, you know what you're building for them. You know their playing style, their musical preferences, etc. You can say yes, this will work for you. I I've turned down more tree builds than I've fit, uh, than I've completed because when they start describing what they want, I realize they're describing a rosewood, they're describing Brazilian or even Indian, um, mm. but they want that visual punch of tree because there's yeah. I don't know that there's a more visually stunning uh, tone wood out there to be honest, but yeah, again, I, subjective. I just yeah, yeah. I just received a uh, a FERC. It's a Red Master's Choice. No, it's it's their sixty eight hundred dollars, seven thousand um, dollar, and it's Coca Bolo on the back and sides. And it to me, it's some of the most figured Coca Bolo I've ever seen, and it's beautiful. And uh, it's, I mean, it's really there are really stunning options out there. But if I'm honest, like it doesn't sound necessarily better. And uh, I think that's the hardest part of all of this is that all of this is deeply subjective. Like it's, oh, yeah. what, do you, what do you want out of a guitar? What do you like when you hear other people play a guitar? Mm -hmm. And yeah, it's, it's all tricky. Yeah. Well, it, I think what, if I work on a guitar and I complete it and string it up and I think, oh, this sounds great. And I'll bring it in the house and strum it for my wife and her face is just blank because she doesn't care about guitars the way I do. I think that's sort of a high like a bit of hyperbole but that's the same sort of thing you might have somebody who just loves guitars yeah and they play a pawn shop uh 150 dollar special and they love that guitar and that's fantastic i've got no problems with that um i think the expectation that y you're not necessarily going to love something more because you spent more on it but i can say that well it'll probably be higher quality if that 
That's true. I, I, I agree with that a lot. So as you think about, and this will be our last question. So as you think about, you're both creating incredible pieces of art that become really substantial and significant to people's lives. And to some sense, their sense of their own identity or what they're like, their creative endeavor is kind of, you know, amplified through these guitars. As you think about those that have gone out, what do you want to be remembered for? Like when you're at the end of your career and you've built however many hundreds of guitars, where do you want to be? I understand that's also a giant question, but what do you want to be remembered for in your work of art? I answered Good. the last one, Leo. It's on you. <laughs> Goody. Just an easy, just an easy question. Um, I go back to the to one of my other res um, answers. Uh, I think uh, I would like to be remembered by by the sound of my guitars. Uh, again, artistically, yeah, I like pretty stuff in general, um, um, but but sound is what drives me the most. That's amazing. Yeah, it's really interesting because you make some of the most beautiful guitars I've ever seen. Mm -hmm. And it's really interesting that you're like, it is the sound of and of course, it's an instrument, it's a musical thing, it has to sound wonderful. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, that's a really interesting answer to me. Yeah, yeah, we, it's we, a very oh, go ahead, Leo. Sorry. No, I, I'm saying we we cannot forget that we are building tools for musicians. You know? Absolutely. For, for, for people who love music. And we bring music to this world. So it's basically a music tool. So for me, that's that's pretty stunning, you know? Yeah. Well, and we, it's not to over romanticize it, but it is kind of a, an impossible task you're put for. Like, there, people have antique furniture that's been around for 100 years, and they go, Oh, have you seen this thing? Well, yeah, it weighs 150 pounds. It's, you know, hmm. it's solid. It's not going anywhere, but we're charged with making something that's delicate and it has to last 100 years. I mean, I would love to be around when the guitars built today are the age that the golden era Martins are now. I would love to be able to hear that and see what Absolutely. all of this, all of these sound like. But, you know, I, I think, yeah, to Leo's point, I would love you know, for the guitar to reach that special place someday where it's respected in the same sense that the Stradivari violin is and, you know, where there's, where we put more emphasis on the sound over the aesthetic appearance of it would be, yeah, totally. that would be something special. And I'm pretty sure you get the same, like uh, many, many times I'm out of the blue, I receive text messages from my clients. Oh man, I'm playing your guitar. I can't believe this. I'm so happy. Oh, it's like a wow. No, it's like a, in the middle of the day, so you receive a text like that, or you receive an email, and and and, and probably I don't know one page email le letting you know how the, your guitar is growing. People, mm. I mean, people yeah. who who buy this kind of guitar, they really care about guitar as much as we we care. Mm -hmm. No, and, and and I feel like uh, it's. I don't know. For me, it's very, very special and, and privileged, you know, to be able to to connect with people uh, through a guitar. No, absolutely. Know. It's uh, it's amazing. It's 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 unbelievable. I I, I never trained this, and mm. it's great. And the the fact that you could fly into almost any major city and run into somebody that has bought one of your instruments. And that's from a, for a kid who grew up in Montana and hasn't traveled very much, you know, outside of the U S that kind of blows my mind that, that, you know, I, I had a guy who he emailed me and said that he was on vacation in, in the Galapagos islands and he missed his guitar back home. And I was like, your world is different than mine, but it's <laughs> impressive to me that like, Something yeah. I made means that much to someone. It's really fun. I really yeah, yeah. that. Totally. Totally. That's amazing. Totally. Yeah. Cool. Well, guys, this has been such a great conversation, and I'm really thankful that you took your time time out of your day to do this. So thank yeah. you. Thank you, Jeremy. Well, thanks for having me. Absolutely. So um, if you want, you guys share, how can people find you on the internet if they want to know more about you, if they want to look at more pictures of your guitars? 
Well, in my case, uh, my website is uh, buendiaguitars.com. Uh, social media, Instagram, Facebook is Buendia Guitars or Leo Buendia, which is perfect. Mm -hmm. And I'll put all the links in the description down below as well. Uh, mine's Howland Guitars. Um, as just as Leo stated, it's internet, Facebook, Instagram, everything. So if you want the website, it's howlandguitars.com. All right. Thanks, everybody. Thanks for watching. I'm Jeremy. I'm the Guitar Hunter. And this is Leo Engage, amazing guitar builders. Go check them out. Thanks for watching. See you guys later.